Hello and welcome to the week four online podcast for LWS 011 Journalism Law. I'm Peter Black. This podcast is the second podcast that we have looking at defamation law. Last week, we looked at the elements of defamation, what is meant by the term defamation. This week, we're looking at the defences that apply to defamation law. So we'll begin with a little bit of a recap and introduction of some of the concepts that we touched upon last week before focusing on the defences that are applicable in a defamation action with a particular emphasis, as you would expect, on the defences that are likely to be available to journalists and media organisations before moving on to briefly look at remedies. That is, what is it that the court can order to try and right the wrong when defamation has indeed occurred? So as we saw last week, the law of defamation aims to protect the balance between the right of the public to know and the personal right of the individual to their reputation. As such, defences are the key to understanding and working with defamation law. This is because having assessed whether there is indeed defamation, that is whether those three elements that we considered last week have been satisfied, it is then necessary to see if there is an applicable or available defence. These defences operate as a legal justification for publishing, even when the material at least appears to be defamatory. It is important to note when we're talking about these defences that the evidentiary onus for establishing a defence for defamation shifts to the defendant or the publisher, as the case may be. So what am I meaning by that? Well, basically, last week's lecture, when we were looking at what constitutes defamation, the plaintiff has to prove those various different elements. The plaintiff has the burden of proving that the publication contains imputations that defame. This week, when we're looking at the defences, the defendant has the burden of proving that the publication is defensible in those circumstances. So the onus does indeed shift depending upon what aspect of defamation law we are talking about. Before turning to the applicable defences, though, it is important to note that media outlets will usually intend to resolve defamation disputes without resorting to litigation, that is, without the matter ultimately going to trial before a court. And this is indeed reflected in this structure uh, and the text of the Defamation Act. Now, part three of the Defamation Act provides a mechanism for publishers to make an offer of amends to an aggrieved person without prejudice to any future case if the offer is rejected. So how does this work? Well, the aggrieved person, that is the person who believes they have been defamed, gives the publisher a concerns notice outlining their concern that they have indeed been defamed. They then have the opportunity, or the publisher then has an opportunity to make an offer of amends within 28 days. If the aggrieved person accepts the offer of amends, then there is no cause of action. If the... uh, aggrieved person refuses a reasonable offer of amends, that then ultimately gives rise to a defence on the part of the publisher. That is to try and offer an incentive to ensure that matters get resolved or settled out of court before they ultimately go to trial. Now, the applicable defences, though, if it does indeed go to trial, are as follows. There's justification, also known as truth, contextual truth, what is referred to as the Polly Peck defence. There is absolute privilege. Uh, there is a report dealing with public documents or a fair report. There is qualified privilege, honest opinion, innocent dissemination, and also triviality. And so we're going to at least briefly look at these available defences. Let's start with justification. Justification arises when the matter is true or substantially true, and it's contained in Section 25 of the Defamation Act. It is a defence to the publication of a defamatory matter if the defendant proves that the defamatory imputations carried by the matter of which the plaintiff complains are substantially true. Substantially true. So, this defence of justification or truth operates as a complete defence. And what does it mean? Well, it means it has to be true in substance and not materially different from the truth. So, some immaterial inaccuracy is not a problem unless it ultimately aggravates the imputation. Now, immaterial 
inaccuracy, it's worth noting, is different from partial justification, especially where there is more than one defamatory imputation. And we'll get on and look at partial justification in a moment. Now, substantial truth is conveyed by the adequacy of the whole of the imputation, and it is not defeated by minor inaccuracy. So you can rely on substantial truth um, as long as it uh, covers the whole of the imputation and is not defeated by minor inaccuracy. So, for example, the identification of a wrong company being in debt to the city council, where those companies were related as parent and subsidiary, will be a substantial inaccuracy and not capable of being considered um, the, of, to be able to rely on the truth defence. And this comes from the case of Hatesbury Holdings and Subiaco. Conversely, though, if a publisher misquoted an Australian business number and not the name of the company, this may be considered a minor inaccuracy which does not go to the truth of the substance of the imputation and it would thus be covered by the truth defence. When Australia got uh, the uniform defamation legislation that we spoke about last week, justification was indeed one of the defences that was affected. And that's because prior to these uniform defamation laws, some states required that the matter be not just true, they also required truth and that the publication be in the public interest. This changed with those uniform defamation laws. And so now all that is required to rely on the defence of justification or truth is indeed truth. There is no additional element of public interest. This defence will fail if a reasonable person would draw undrew, untrue inferences. And the defendant needs to be able to justify all imputations. This can create quite tricky evidentiary issues, especially in cases that rely on confidential sources. Now, there are a few particular aspects here to consider. One uh, relates to the publication of convictions. And so when is it safe for a reporter to state that an individual has been convicted of a crime? The relevant section here is section 42, and there must be proof that the person was convicted is conclusive evidence that the person committed the offence. So this includes a finding of guilt. It does not apply where a conviction has been quashed or set aside or if the person has been pardoned. Now, a uh, second uh, more specific matter that we might look at comes from the case of Millane and Nationwide News Limited trading as Cumberland newspapers, and this is considered in the textbook. Now, in that case, we had a situation where the Mossman Daily in northern Sydney published an article headed Avenue Road Standoff. It told the story of a young couple with a baby who had rented a flat above a real estate office but the real estate landlords had changed the locks on the office so they could not access their residence. The club couple claimed that they were the meat in the sandwich in a dispute between the directors of the real estate business and the former director who had sold his share of the property after renting their apartment to them. Now, the newspaper received defamation threats during the research phase, so they had their story reviewed five times by their lawyers, and they ran with three defences, including justification, which at the time was substantial truth plus, plus public interest. They also relied uh, on the other defences of qualified privilege and fair comment, which is now known as honest opinion. But we're really focusing on uh, the issue of truth or substantial truth here. And in this case, the judge pointed out uh, through the evidence submitted, explaining as to why the newspaper's witnesses' evidence was more plausible than the real estate agent plaintiff's evidence on most matters, uh, which goes in to uh, provide quite an illuminating uh, illustration or insight into the weighing of the balance of probabilities when we're dealing with the truth of defence. This case is also instructive to the extent to which the newspaper reported attempted to obtain and record the other side of the story an essential platform for most defences, though not a defence in its own right. But you can read more about this case, also known as the real estate case in the textbook. The next defamation is that of contextual truth. And this is different from justification or truth. When we're talking about contextual truth, it arises in a situation where the story contains several defamatory imputations, 
and the media defendant can only prove the truth of the more serious ones. Now, there are two elements that we get from Section 26 of the Defamation Act when dealing with the issue of contextual truth. The first is that the matter carried one or more imputations that are substantially true. The second element is that the defamatory imputation, um, or that the defamatory imputation that cannot be proved, does not further harm the person's reputation. So, for example, a publication alleges that Sarah kicks her dog and steals from her clients. If the second allegation can be proven, then the first allegation may be covered by the defense of contextual truth, as it will not further harm Sarah's reputation. Another defense here is known as the Polly Peck defense. Now, this arises where the defamatory material is characterized as not containing several and distinct imputations, but instead comprises a whole imputation with the common sting that the publisher may plead the truth defense by demonstrating that the common sting is true. Now, this polypec defense is not explicitly contained in the legislation. It is rather a matter of common law. But let's have a look at how it would nonetheless operate. So a publication alleges that John stole from Ashley in January, from Ben in February, and from Charles in February. The common sting of those imputations is that John is a thief. Now, proof of the allegations that John stole from Ashley and Ben will be enough to raise a successful defence for defamation, even if the publisher uh, cannot prove that John stole from Charles. So the, what the defence or how the defence operates here is that the common sting of the um, separate and distinct imputations is indeed true. The next defence that we'll consider is that of absolute privilege. We're not going to spend too much time on this defence because journalists won't qualify for this defence unless they are personally appearing as a witness in court or before a parliamentary body. Nonetheless, as it underpins the defence of fair report, it is important to have at least some familiarity with the defence of absolute privilege. Now, absolute privilege gives a complete defence to anyone speaking during court or parliamentary proceedings and to documents tabled there and to publications under the authority of such a body. The basis for absolute privilege can be seen as being for clear grounds of public policy. That is, the publication of defamatory imputations were required for the effective performance of the state through its arms of government. It is important to note for absolute privilege that it is the occasion, proceedings, or event that attract the privilege, not the statements made concerning the occasion. That is, when the issue which qualifies for the defence of absolute privilege is over, then any protection regarding any publication is also over. Absolute privilege does not protect those individuals who would otherwise be able to claim absolute privilege if they are outside the forum which the privilege attracts. That is to say that if you are a judge or a politician, when you make those remarks in court or in parliament, then the defense of absolute privilege applies. It does not apply if those same remarks are made outside that forum, that is outside court or parliament. Absolute privilege, as noted within the absolute part, protects a publisher no matter the accuracy or the deleterious effect on an individual's reputations. That is even so where there is an element of malice. This arose in the case of uh, Michael Kirby uh, and the statements that uh, Bill Heffernan made back in 2002. And so there is an extract here reporting about those incidents. So last Tuesday night, as the world knows, Senator Bill Heffernan, Parliamentary Secretary to the Cabinet and close friend of Prime Minister John Howard, rose in the Senate and accused a Justice of the High Court of Australia, Michael Kirby, of using a Commonwealth car to pick up male prostitutes. These allegations had been made before, though not in public, but Heffernan claimed to have new evidence. This week, that evidence turned out to be a statutory declaration from a discredited witness and a forged Comcar docket. On Monday night, Howard told Heffernan to resign and apologise. Kirby has had his name cleared, but since Heffernan is protected by parliamentary privilege, which means he cannot be sued for defamation, there is nothing more than that Kirby can do. So this was an incident, or an incident where the statement was made 
in Parliament, and as such, it was protected by absolute privilege. If the individual concerned, Bill Hefner, had made those statements outside Parliament, he would not be able to rely on the defence of absolute privilege. The next defence is uh, public documents. Now, Section 28.1 of the Defamation Act provides that it is a defence to the publication of a defamatory matter if the defendant proves that the matter was contained in A, a public document or a fair copy of a public document, or B, a fair summary of or a fair extract from a public document. So, what then is meant by the term public document? Now, Section 28.4 of the Defamation Act gives us a list. But basically, public documents include records of parliamentary proceedings, court judgments, documents of government and officials, and other public records. As I said, for a more complete list, you can see Section 28.4 of the Defamation Act. The difficulty here, though, of course, is properly and accurately summarising um, public documents in some instances. That's not necessarily always an easy task. And the defence will be defeated if the matter was not published honestly for the information of the public or the advancement of education. So there is that uh, limit there. The next defence is that of fair report. The defence of fair report suggests that the public interest in being informed outweighs the detrimental effect of the reputation of the individual people. In particular, this privilege protects the public interest of having people scrutinise the courts and participate in political processes. Relevantly, it's Section 29.1 of the Defamation Act, which provides that it is a defence to the publication of defamatory matter if the defendant proves that the matter was or was contained in a fair report of any proceedings of public concern. As such, the publisher must prove the following to rely upon the defence of fair report. The publisher must prove, first of all, that the matter was contained in an earlier published report of proceedings of public concern. That, secondly, the matter was contained in a fair copy or fair summary or fair extract. And that, thirdly, the publisher had no knowledge that would reasonably make the publisher aware that the earlier published report was not fair. So as you can imagine, the defence of fair report is relied on relatively frequently by journalists and media organisations. Now, what is meant by that term proceedings of public concern? So here we're talking about proceedings of public bodies, including parliamentary bodies, public proceedings of international organisations, uh, proceedings in courts, local government, inquiries, learned societies, sports or recreational associations, trade associations, and public meetings of shareholders. The defence, however, will be defeated if the matter was not published honestly for the information of the public or the advancement of education. And a case that uh, applies this defence of fair report is known as the Eye Surgeon case, uh, which is Rogers and Nationwide News Proprietary Limited. In that case, a prominent eye surgeon was sued for damages by a patient who had lost the sight of her left eye after he had operated on her right eye. The blindness was not caused during the operation itself, but was the result of a rare side effect of the operation where a good eye develops a sympathetic blindness. The court held the surgeon should have warned the patient about the 1 in 14,000 risk of such a condition developing and awarded her damages. An ensuing case involved a dispute between the patient and the taxation department over whether the interest on damages she had been awarded in the negligence case was classed as taxable income. She lost that case, and Sydney's Daily Telegraph devoted its front page to the story of the taxation commissioner's victory. The main heading was Blind Justice, accompanied by a photograph of her walking with a white cane. The heading on the article read, Scrooge Taxman wins legal battle to take $168,000 from a woman robbed of sight by a surgeon's negligence. The intro to the story said she was blinded by a surgeon's negligence. The article went on to say that she was blinded during an eye operation and that she lost sight in both eyes after an operation involving corneal grafts performed by a prominent eye surgeon. The reporter relied on the judge's short and incomplete summary of the previous case, where he had simply 
stated that the patient had been operated upon by the surgeon and ultimately lost her sight in both eyes. He also spoke of her damages for personal injury suffered at the hands of the surgeon. Now, the surgeon sued, claiming the article conveyed the imputation that he had negligently and carelessly performed the eye operation. The New South Wales Court of Appeal upheld the newspaper's appeal that the journalist's report of the judge's summary of the previous case was a protected report under the Defamation Act. However, it was then appealed to the High Court, and the High Court held unanimously that the Daily Telegraph did not meet the requirements of the defence, which only protected the newspaper if it did not have knowledge which should have made it aware that the taxation case judge's summary of the negligence case was not a protected report of those proceedings. The onus was on the newspaper to access its own records as well as the original transcript of the first case to get full facts for its report. It should have known that the judge's summary in the taxation case was not a fair report of the negligence case. Now, in one part, as uh, Pearson and Polden note, uh, this decision complicated the traditional role of court reporting by, at the very least, forcing journalists to go back to their own newspaper's files of previous court reports rather than rely on a judge's courtroom account of a previous case. But it nonetheless does illustrate uh, the difficulties of sometimes relying on this defence of their report. The next defence we're going to consider is that of qualified privilege. Now, the defence of qualified privilege is basically a more limited extension of the doctrine of absolute privilege. The law of defamation recognises that not all publications will be in the echelon of absolute privilege, though there are lesser public interests which may nonetheless justify the publication of defamatory material. Now, there are three types of qualified privilege that we need to consider. The first is what's described as common law qualified privilege. The second is statutory qualified privilege, which we find in Section 30 of the Defamation Act. Then there is also what's known as the extended political qualified privilege, which stems from the constitutional protection of political communication that we looked at when we were talking about uh, the law relating to free speech in Week 2. So first, common law qualified privilege. The common law defence of qualified privilege applies where first, the defendant has an interest in making the defamatory statement, or second, where the defendant has a legal, social or moral duty to make the statement. So, for example, teachers need to be able to frankly discuss with other teachers, students, attitudes and performance. This defence requires, however, reciprocity, though. Does the audience have a reciprocal interest in receiving the information? Now, as this common law defence of qualified privilege uh, usually only applies for small audiences, this defence is of limited relevance to the media. What's more relevant, though, uh, is, as we'll see, the defence of statutory qualified privilege. But more a little bit briefly on the common law qualified privilege. There are, however, three exceptions where reciprocity is not required, where there is a retort to a defamatory attack, where there is a correction of a previous publication, or public warnings against public threats, including official warnings. It's also worth noting that abuse of privilege, that is malice or improper purpose, will defeat this defence. And this might arise or be inferred where the defendant doesn't honestly believe the statement is true, where the defendant was actuated by spite or ill will, where the defendant introduced extraneous and irrelevant matter into the statement, or where the publication exceeds what is reasonable. So, let's now focus, though, on the qualified privilege that is more likely to arise in the context of journalists and media organisations, and that is the statutory qualified privilege. Now, this comes from Section 30 of the Defamation Act, uh, and it contains three elements. To rely on the defence of statutory qualified privilege, a publisher must prove that first of all, the recipient has an interest or apparent interest in receiving information on some subject. Uh, secondly, the defamatory matter is published to the recipient in the course of giving them information on that subject. And that thirdly, the conduct of the publisher in publishing the matter is reasonable in the circumstances. So, what is reasonable in the circumstances? Well, the court will consider a range of different factors. They'll look at public interest. 
the extent to which the matter relates to the performance of public functions or activities of a person, the seriousness of the defamatory implication, the extent to which the matter distinguishes between suspicions, allegations, and proven facts, whether it was in the public interest in the circumstances for the matter to be published expeditiously, the nature of the business environment in which the defendant operates, the sources of information and the integrity of those sources, whether the matter contained the substance of the person's side of the story, and if not, whether a reasonable attempt was made to obtain and publish a response from the person, and also steps taken to verify the information. The statutory defence of qualified privilege is also defeated by malice. So almost conclusive where the defendant knows the statement is false, but may also be inferred where the publication exceeds what is reasonable or where the defendant was motivated by spite or ill will. So that's the defence of statutory qualified privilege. We also need to consider the extended political qualified privilege that arises as a result of the implied freedom of political communication that we've already looked at in this unit. Now, the key case here, of course, is Longy and the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. Now, again, just to remind, in that case, the plaintiff, Longy, was a member of the New Zealand Parliament and a former Prime Minister. He bought an action in defamation against the ABC, alleging that he had been defamed during a Four Corners program. Now, the High Court held here that the Constitution conferred no private right of defence, but instead created an immunity against legislative incursion into free communication in respect of political matters. And in reaching that, the court expanded the common law defence of qualified privilege to provide a protection for criticism of politicians. So, in Longy, the High Court held that, first of all, the Constitution prescribes a particular system of representative government, and that voters should therefore be able to make a free and informed choice. And common convenience and welfare of the society required an extension of existing qualified privilege where that communication was about government or political matters, and the publisher's conduct was reasonable, and that publication was not actuated by malice. The next defence is that of honest opinion. Now, this is a very important defence for all opinion and commentary in the news media. The relevant section here is section 31 of the Defamation Act, and it is, provides that there are three elements. To rely on the defence of honest opinion, the publisher must prove first, the matter was an expression of opinion rather than a statement of fact. Second, the opinion related to a matter of public interest. And that thirdly, the opinion was based on proper material. First element an expression of opinion rather than a statement of fact. So the sort of things we're looking for when we're looking for an expression of opinion are words like I think or I feel or it is my opinion that. But of course, an opinion can be inferred. Where someone is using statements or phrases like I know or it is, that suggests that it is more likely to be a statement of fact and makes it harder to rely on this defense of honest opinion. Now, the second element is that it must be related to a matter of public interest. Now, to be in the public interest, the information must relate to something in the public domain, either affecting the public at large or submitted to the public for approval. The third element is that it must be based on proper material. So this means that it's either expressly or implied to identify as what you were talking about. Now, this element can usually be easily satisfied. So, for example, if you are reviewing a play, the play will be proper material. There are separate defences for expression of opinion by an employee and agent, as well as expression of opinion by a commentator. And the defence will be defeated if the opinion was not honestly held. Now, there are two cases um, that uh, touch upon this, Carlton and the ABC, and uh, also uh, the Lobster Case, or Blue Angel Restaurant and John Fairfax and Sons. So let's uh, consider each of these briefly. So, Carlton and the ABC. In this case, the ABC's Media Watch program accused 60 Minutes reporter Richard Carlton of plagiarising a British Broadcasting Corporation documentary in order to create a report titled The Evil That Men Do, which had first been broadcast in 2000. Although they were not named in the report, the program's executive producer and segment producer joined in this suit against the ABC, as well as Media Watch's presenter Paul Barry and its producer Peter McAvoy. 
Now, Justice Higgins found the Media Watch program contained imputations of plagiarism and lazy journalism, but not of theft of materials from other programs or deceit or dishonesty. He upheld the defence of fair comment when all other defences failed. The judge also took the unusual step of calling for reform of defamation law because he viewed the availability of this defence as unfair. The other case um, that's worth sort of mentioning here is, as I said, the lobster case, Blue Angel Restaurant and John Fairfax and Sons. Uh, this is the uh, classic case dealing with the workings of the fair comment uh, defence. The case resulted from a restaurant review written in 1984 by the Sydney Morning Herald's then food critic Leo Schofield. The review was headed High Drama Where Lobsters Have No Privacy and was quite a scathing review. Uh, of the uh, restaurant. Now, the restaurant uh, sued, uh, and there were several imputations um, that they uh, claimed in that uh, law suit. And ultimately, the Herald and Schofield failed in their attempt to use the fair comment defence. The key reason the defence of fair comment failed in that case was that they did not satisfy some of the basic requirements of the defence. Most importantly, they were unable to prove the truth of the facts on which the opinion had been based, at least some of which appeared to have been exaggerated. They had, after all, eaten the evidence. Uh, the restaurant was awarded $100,000 in damages over the article. And again, you can read more about that case in the textbook. The next defence is that of innocent, innocent dissemination. Now, is it, a, it is a defence where the defendant published the matter as a subordinate distributor and neither knew nor reasonably could have known that the matter was defamatory. So, what is meant by the term subordinate distributor? Uh, we're talking about a bookseller, newsagent or other venue, a librarian, a wholesaler or retailer, a postal or similar service, and a broadcaster of a live program where the broadcaster does not have effective control over the person who makes the defamatory statements. There's also the defence of triviality. Section 33 of the Defamation Act provides that it is a defence to the publication of defamatory matter if the defendant proves that the circumstances of publication were such that the plaintiff was unlikely to sustain any harm. So those then are the defences. Let's look briefly at the remedies. The two main remedies that the court can order, the two main things the court can order to try and right the wrong are damages and also injunctions. Uh, and when we're talking about damages, the new uniform defamation laws require that damages must now bear a rational relationship with the harm suffered. Non-economic damages are also capped at a quarter of a million dollars. Exemplary damages are no longer rewarded, and damages can be mitigated by, for example, an apology or a correction, but can also um, be aggravated by falsity, conducting a malafide defense, or failure to properly apologize. As I said, they can also grant an injunction. Now, this will generally be an interlocutory injunction. Um, to get this order, um, the plaintiff needs to show that there was a serious question to be tried and a balance of convenience in favour of the plaintiff. There is an exception, though, an interlocutory injunction for defamation where a subsequent finding by a jury that the matter complained of was not defamatory would be set aside as unreasonable. There is no real ground for supposing that the defendant may succeed upon any defence or justification, privilege or comment, and the plaintiff is likely to recover more than merely nominal damages. Normally, no interlocutory injunction is granted if the effect of the injunction is to restrain the discussion in the media of matters of public interest or concern. This now brings us to an end of the podcast in week four, dealing with the defences to defamation. Now, both this week's podcast and last week's podcast, both of which dealt with defamation, will hopefully all come together in the workshop that we have, uh, where we will begin to apply these principles to various different scenarios. Thank you.